pastor this morning. Guys, give a round of applause for Joanna. Our sister has something on her heart this morning, and we just really wanted to hear what the Lord was saying. And so she's going to be a faithful steward of God's word. And if it's on her heart, it's on ours. Amen? Amen. Good morning. Sorry, I already have connected with John Cruz this morning, and he promised he would do his best to stay awake in the comfy chairs. So I'm on this side of the mic, so I'm going to know exactly who's dozing off this morning. So I pulled out my trusty old Methodist hymnal from back in the day. And a hymn has really been resonating in my heart for a lot of this year. It's going to be very familiar to most of you. Faith of our fathers living still in spite of dungeon, fire, and sword. Oh, how our hearts beat high with joy whenever we hear that glorious word. Faith of our fathers, holy faith, we will be true to thee till death. And that's kind of the cornerstone of my word this morning. That was written in the 1800s by Frederick Faber in honor of the English martyrs. When I was a kid in school, I hated history. To me, it was just a list of cold, hard facts. It was lifeless. What does it mean to me? Nothing. So a day or two before the test, I would cram, yep, and I would memorize as many of those names, dates, people, and places as I could and take the test and get a decent grade, and a few days later, it was all forgotten. So it didn't really make an impact in my life. But God drew my heart to a history teacher, my husband. <laughs> and he would tell me, oh, you're just, you're just not understanding the story of history. There's a story there. And then I started homeschooling, and as I would go through some of these um, history books, it would start to come to life when you're on the other side and you're teaching it. And then we came across this one that I've been going through with Caleb, and it really focuses on the history of the church through the timeline of history. And God opened my eyes wide up, and he was asking me, do you see my hand from creation until now and still to come? When you look at history through the eyes of God, it is amazing because the church, let me tell you, from our Jewish roots through on, on through the crucifixion of Christ and, the, and the, the New Testament church till today, there were dark, hard times. And yet, there is always a remnant. There is always a light. His word is always preserved for the next generation. So, we are going to take a little journey back in time this morning. And I just want to hit, I mean, we could spend years talking about the testimonies from history of God's children rising above and doing extraordinary exploits. But I just picked out a few points in history this morning that I just want to take you back in time and, and reminisce about. So it's been just a little while after Christ's death and resurrection the church is multiplying very quickly during this time. The Roman Empire is still intact, along with the Jewish hierarchy. Both are hostile to the gospel. When people came to Christ, they did so fully understanding that this could cost them everything. Put yourself in that time and place. It's approaching the time that was secretly set to gather with the saints to worship and pray together. It's nearing the midnight hour. You wake your children, you wrap them up in blankets, and you remind them to be very quiet. Through the dark, you and your family creep through the narrow alleys to the outskirts of town and down into the dark catacombs where the dead are placed. 
Why the catacombs, you might ask? Because the Roman soldiers were very superstitious people, and they believed that the spirits of the dead came around during the night, and so they were afraid to go into the catacombs. So they knew they were safe there. Imagine perhaps the scent, the smell, the, the dampness, the darkness. So you and your family, you make it there and you go down into the dark catacombs. The candles are lit and you're safe. You sing songs of praise. You take communion, much like we did this morning. And they prayed for their persecutors. Then the candles are blown out and you start back out into the night for home. You hear a stick break. You turn quickly to see it's just a small animal scurrying away. Your heart's beating rapidly, but you're okay this time. Now several hundred years have passed, and the Roman Empire is crumbling. Christians have lived in relative peace for some time now since Emperor Constantine's kind of conversion. Now the barbarian Germanic tribes are invading. Christian values are being traded out for all forms of sin and evil practice. Some church fathers like St. Benedict and some others start the monastic movement, the monks, the nuns, as we might refer to them today. Moving out and away in order to preserve the integrity of God's word in a time when corruption was becoming increasingly pervasive in the Catholic Church. Many would head out to the deserts and other wilderness areas in order to protect God's word from being perverted. These monastics risked excommunication and being burned at the stake by their own church for what they did. Let's fast forward a few more hundred years. During the Reformation, as many are familiar with um, Martin Luther and others who were trying to bring about change to the church, there was a group of Anabaptists who came about called the Moravians. This group dared to believe that you should not be baptized as an infant, something a lot of us take for granted today, that when you come to a point where you can say yes to Jesus and repent of your sin, that that is the point of baptism. They were one of the first to recognize that that was the Bible teaching. In a time where all early Protestants were persecuted for their faith, this group was particularly hated, even though they were pacifists. This group believed in living communally. They literally shared all of life with each other. Much like the early church, they worshiped in the dark of night under the cover of dark forests. Again, go back in time. You've gathered for a communal meal. One of the elders stands up. He gives testimonies from Brother John, who sent a letter back from prison. Testimonies of soldiers and inmates who have come to Christ. What joy. John's execution is scheduled for Friday. But he reminds us of the great hope we have in Christ. He says to tell his mom and dad that he loves them and how grateful he is for them sharing the gospel with him. Now it's time to draw straws. Two more men will be chosen from the community by God to be a witness and a missionary to the lost. It could be any of the men who were considered of adult age. Your son and your sister's husband have been chosen. There's an 80% chance you will never see them again. A little while later, a new world has been discovered, America. Ships are leaving regularly, offering hope of adventure, wealth, and freedom. The Puritans, too, had suffered persecution in Europe. They longed for a land where they could freely worship their God the way they believed the Bible taught. 
what a privilege it would be to teach their children the word of God, to have worship services, and to pray openly without fear of arrest or worse. We know now on this side of history that starvation, possible native attacks, and extreme cold and disease were facing them. But religious freedom, which would become the heartbeat of this nation, was worth it. Now we're going to do a quick jump into much more recent history, some that many of you will remember, the spread of communism from the late 1940s through the 1980s, with some communist states still around today. The Soviet Union was a terrible place to be if you were a person of any faith. It is believed that under Joseph Stalin, more than twice as many people were murdered as under Hitler. Many of these were people of faith. When families dared to remove their children from the brainwashing communist schools, the children would permanently be removed from their parents to be raised by the government. Any future problems from those parents would certainly mean imprisonment or death. It was quoted by a Christian father in prison as he was praying, Thank you, Father, for our persecutors. They reveal your true church. So why do I share these stories? It's not to make you sad. It's not to make you feel bad. It's not to show how comfortable we really are as American believers. But rather, in this season of Thanksgiving, and as we're approaching Christmas, which is a season of hope, that we have something to look back and to learn from, to be encouraged by, and to be thankful for. We continue to have spiritual fathers who are out there plowing the ground. I think of the stories that Ron has told over the years of going overseas, being on the wrong end of machine guns and, and all kinds of situations, extreme cold and eating food that a meat and potatoes guy does not necessarily enjoy. But you do what you have to do when it comes to fulfilling the call of God in your life. And sometimes that does mean sacrifice. Hebrews 12.1 reminds us that there is a great cloud of witnesses cheering us on. God has a call on each of our lives. Whether it's being a stay-at-home mom, like myself, or whether it's being a missionary in a possible in a in a environment that is hostile to the gospel, think of China, think of parts of Africa, the Middle East. It is life-threatening to be there. But it doesn't matter what the call is on your life, it's are we doing something today to fulfill it? And Hebrews 12.1 reminds us that there is a great cloud of witnesses up there cheering us on with the captain himself, Jesus Christ. What kinds of things might, might that team be up there cheering us for? What, what kinds of things might they be saying? I, I kind of like to think about that. So I looked up some scriptures. Some of these are my very favorites. And I can imagine, because many of these were written by Paul, who I'm sure is one of those cheerleaders up there, said many of these things. Galatians 6, 9. Let us not become weary in doing good, for at the proper time we will reap a harvest if we do not give up. Hebrews 10:24. And let us consider how we may spur one another on toward love and good deeds. Ephesians 6.13 Therefore, put on the full armor of God, so that when the day of evil comes, you may be able to stand your ground. And after you have done everything, to stand. Philippians 3.14 I press on toward the goal to win the prize 
for which God has called me heavenward in Christ Jesus. So what has God called you to do? Who is he calling you to lead to repentance? Who is he calling you to pray and intercede for? What legacy will you leave for Christ and his kingdom? Our tomorrow is not guaranteed. It was not guaranteed for any of them, and it came much shorter for many of them than what they probably imagined. But the days do grow dark, as we see in scripture prophesied. Will we shine for him no matter what? Or will our comfortable lifestyle get the best of us? Will we speak the word even when it's easier to grumble and complain? Christianity has historically spread exponentially faster in those areas that are under heavy persecution. The underground church in China, for example, grows so fast, so fast. And yet sometimes we see in the Western world it can kind of be tougher ground to make a harvest from. Now this sounds heavy, and, and I get ya. This is a convicting word for me. But just remember, when it seems like it's overwhelming, that there's a great cloud of witnesses, and the Holy Spirit is in you, guiding you, helping you, strengthening you, comforting you. They are your cheerleaders. Christ is continuously making intercession for you. So when we feel, I can't do this, Christ is up there saying, yeah, you can. Yes, you can. Yes, you can. When you've done all you can do to stand, stand. So I want to end with my favorite movie clip. And some of you, I've already tortured you with this and, and other things. But I'm going to make you watch it anyway because I get to do that today. But it's from the movie Facing the Giants, and it's my very favorite. And when my soul is downcast for whatever reason, I love to watch this video clip because it just encourages me. But I want you to watch it, and I want you to pay particular attention to the coach of the football team. And then we'll wrap it up. Dude. So, Coach, how strong is Westview this year? A lot stronger than we are. You already written Friday night down as a loss, Brock? Well, not if I knew we could beat them. Come here, Brock. You too, Jeremy. What, am I in trouble now? Not yet. I want to see you do the death crawl again, except I want to see your absolute best. <laughs> What, you want me to go to the 30? I think you can go to the 50. The 50? I can go to the 50 if nobody's on my back. I think you can do it with Jeremy on your back. But even if you can, I want you to promise me you're going to do your best. All right. Your best. OK. You going to give me your best? I'm going to give you my best. All right, one more thing. I want you to do it blindfolded. Why? Because I want you giving up at a certain point when you can go further. Get down. Jeremy, get on his back. I get a good tight hold, Jeremy. All right, let's go, Brock. Keep your knees off the ground, just your hands and feet. There you go. A little bit left. A little bit left. There you go. Show me good effort. That way, Brock. You keep coming. There you go. It's a good start. A little bit left. A little bit left. There you go, Brock. Good strength. <laughs> That's it, Brock. That's it. Not the 20 yet? Forget the 20. You give me your best. You keep going. That's it. No, don't stop, Brock. You got more in you than that. Hey, done. I'm just resting a second. You got to keep moving. Let's keep moving. Let's go. Don't quit till you got nothing left. There you go. Keep moving. Keep moving. Keep moving, Brock. That's it. You keep driving. Keep your knees off the ground. Keep driving it. Your very best. Your very best. Your very best. Keep moving, Brock. That's it. That's it. That's
That's it. Keep going. Don't quit on me. Keep going. Keep driving. It. Keep driving. Keep your knees off the ground. That's it. Your very best. Don't quit on me. Your very best. Keep driving. Keep driving. There you go. There you go. That's it. You keep driving. Keep your knees off the ground. Keep driving it. Don't quit till you got nothing left. Keep moving, Brock. That's it. That's it. That's it. Keep going. I want everything you got. Come on, keep going. It hurts. Don't quit on me. Your very best. Keep driving. Keep driving. There you go. There you go. He's heavy. I know I'm, he's heavy. I'm bad out of strength. Then you negotiate with your body to find more strength, but don't you give up on me, Brock. You keep going, you hear me? You keep going. You're doing good. You keep going. Do not quit on me. You keep going. It hurts. I know it hurts. You keep going. You keep going. It's all hard from here. 30 more steps. You keep going, Brock. Come on. Keep going. Burn. And let it burn. It burn. It's all hard. You keep going, Brock. Come on. Come on. Keep going. You will be your best. Your best. Don't stop. Keep going. It's too hard. It's not too hard. You keep going. Come on, Brock. Give me more. Give me more. Keep going. 20 more steps. 20 more. Keep going, Brock. Give me your best. Look up, Brock. You're in the end zone. Brock, you are the most influential player on this team. If you walk around defeated, so will they. Oh, tell me you can't give me more than what I've been seeing. You just carried a 140-pound man across this whole field on your arms. Brock, I need you. God's gifted you with the ability of leadership. Don't waste it. Coach? Can I count on you? Yes. Coach? What is it, Jeremy? I want a 160. gets me every time. So just as an encouragement to you guys this morning, when we are tempted to put our hands down and hang our heads, that's your coach. That's your cheerleaders. And not only, the coach didn't just stand up next to him. What did he do? He got down in the dirt with him. He is always with you. Do not hang your heads. Do not speak those negative things. And boy, am I preaching that to me this morning. Do not give up. Your coach is there with you, and he has called you to so much more than this. He's called you up higher, but he didn't leave you to figure it out on your own. He is cheering you on, and he will give you the steps, and he will show you how to get there. Amen? John? Um, for those that know me very well, know that I am uh, very interested in hearing the voice of God. And uh, a few months ago, uh, I was making my coffee in the morning. He can talk to you then, too. And the thing that came to my mind was outlast. And I says, outlast what? 
And he says, outlast the devil. That's it. So I will open it up to worship and the prayer team. If there is anything that you need somebody to just stand in agreement with you this morning, whether it would be healing, maybe you don't know this coach yet. Maybe you don't know Jesus. Don't leave this place without meeting him this morning. Maybe you've just been a place of comfort and ease and you just need a little fire in your bones. Come on up. We'll pray with you.